Much like the parable of the cave, the Republic itself has an ascent and descent structure. We have been consistently ascending. The pinnacle of our ascent was when we reached the sun, or in other words, when we discussed the idea of the good and the divided line at the end of book six. Now we begin the descent. We discuss in book seven the education of the guardians, the rulers and protectors of the perfectly just city. Now we've known for a long time that education is paramount in Plato's Republic. And we've known that the guardians are going to receive a very carefully crafted form of education. In today's lecture, we'll begin with looking at what you might call the nuts and bolts of this form of education, the actual curriculum that the guardians have to undergo. This is the sense in which I mean we are beginning a descent. No longer are we going to operate at the highest peaks of abstraction and universality. We're beginning our move downwards back to what most people rather erroneously call the real world. The principal subject that the guardians must study is that subject which affects their soul. Socrates is even more specific. He says, and I'll quote from line 521d, the guardians must study a subject that draws the soul from becoming to being. Becoming and being are two words we've used before. If you recall, becoming is a region of reality. It's a category of reality. It expresses those kinds of things which come into being and pass out of being. Finite, mortal, temporary, transient, fleeting things. The things of the world of our senses. Anything we can touch with our hands or see with our eyes is changing and anything we can sense will eventually disappear. The other great region of reality is being, the permanent, the changeless, the purely intelligible, that which has no interaction with matter, that which must be thought but cannot be seen. To reiterate, the guardians need a subject that will, to use what is now a familiar metaphor, turn them around from becoming to being. This is part of the process of leaving the cave. This is part of the process of ascending up the divided line. And what is this subject? Perhaps you can predict it's arithmetic. Socrates at 522c identifies this subject by describing it as the lowly business of distinguishing the one, the two, and the three. I mean by this number. The Greek word for number is arithmos, and it's the root of our word arithmetic. Recall a major theme that we discussed in our study of the divided line. The guardians who are undergoing this rigorous form of education do not study mathematics for practical purposes. This is the way, of course, mathematics is studied in most universities today. It was the way most people even would have studied mathematics in ancient Greece. We learn a little bit of math and then we use it. Not the guardians. The guardians study mathematics, to repeat the metaphor, in order to turn around. They study, and I'm now referring to 525c, the nature of numbers themselves. They're interested not in commerce. They're not interested in technical applications of mathematics. They're interested in the pure study of numbers. In modern language, this is described as number theory. 
After they study arithmetic, the guardians study plane geometry, solid geometry, theoretical astronomy, and harmonics. And this occupies much of Book 7. In order to understand Book 7 and its treatment of these very specific mathematical disciplines, one must study ancient mathematics. It's a very difficult and arcane subject, and I'm not going to discuss it in this lecture. So there will be large passages which I would much rather treat in a very general manner and not go into detail. The main theme of today's lecture is not the specifics of ancient harmonics, although for many people that's an interesting subject, but in a very general sense, the nature of mathematics and why it was so important to Plato. We've already taken good steps towards understanding this in our discussion of the divided line. We're really elaborating on some of the points we discussed then. In a nutshell, again, as we learned from the divided line, mathematics is the best preparation for dialectic, the study of the purely formal structure of the whole of reality. But let me, let me suggest to you um, a way of thinking about Plato's understanding of mathematics that, that might help us understand. In particular, if you go back to the divided line, you'll recall that at level B, we find mathematical objects, and above that in level A, we find the forms. And at the time of discussing it, I suggested that it's really not so obvious what the relationship is between mathematics and the forms. And that's what I want to talk about right now for a few minutes. Let me put the point in the following way. Think of the kinds of issues in which we have very real disagreement. You and I might disagree about the painting in the museum. And I say it's beautiful, and you say it's ugly. You and I might disagree about a specific tax policy. You might say it's unfair to tax rich people more than we tax poor people. And I might say, no, it's perfectly just to do that. We disagree. You might say it's good to give money to charity. I might say it's bad to give money to charity. These are the issues, of course, that human beings have always intensely engaged in conflict over. Now contrast that realm of disagreement with the realm of mathematics. None of us would ever disagree that 2 plus 2 equals 4. We take that to be a simple, universal, objective truth. We take it to be 100% clear that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Take us back to the museum and imagine the discussion in which we're disagreeing about the beauty of the painting. Well, that's a hard discussion to have because it's not clear what you mean by beauty or what I mean by beauty. Our disagreement about the tax policy. It's not clear what you think justice is, what I think justice is. And that's perhaps the reason why our disagreement goes on for such a long time. And in fact, it seems as if we can't resolve it. I would suggest that the very best way to think of the relationship between mathematics and the forms and in turn, to understand Plato's deep appreciation of mathematics and the prominent place he gives it in the education of the guardians, because after all, their education seems to be almost exclusively mathematical, is to think of the Platonic forms as containing many of the same qualities that mathematics has, but operating in a different sphere. Another word that might be useful here, think of the forms as a projection of mathematical qualities onto issues like beauty and justice. Socrates believes that there is a 
form of beauty, a form of justice. Beauty itself, justice itself. What are they? They would be the answer to the famous Socratic question, what is beauty, what is justice? They would be forms. And they would have precisely the same sorts of qualities that mathematical truth, as we would all agree, already has. They would be, these forms, would be clear and distinct and universal and objective. Now this, as we've suggested before, is very hard to imagine. It's very hard to imagine being in a museum and having an intense disagreement about a painting and thinking it could be resolved in the same way that a, a, an arithmetical problem can be resolved. If I ask you to, mu to multiply 75 times 152, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I know that we will all reach it if we do the steps properly or if we use a calculator and we will end up with the same answer. And we won't disagree. You and I will not come to blows over that mathematical problem. We may very well, however, come to blows about tax policy. We may disagree so vehemently that we can't find a common ground. The great platonic hope, the great platonic projection is to project these kinds of mathematical attributes onto precisely those questions that right now seem to be so far from being resolvable. As I have several times in this course, I'll remind you yet again that in Plato's youth, in the 5th century, he witnessed tremendous turmoil. He witnessed his fellow citizens literally killing each other. This made, without a doubt, an enormous impression on him. And much of his thinking, I think, can be derived from this impulse. How do we resolve conflict? How do we come to harmony among ourselves? The Platonic forms may be conceived, in fact, as a hopeful vision in which conflict about those most basic values, the values that people are willing to die for, values like goodness and justice can be resolved. Let me shift focus a little bit and look at mathematics from another perspective. I think Plato would say that mathematics is a wonderful example of community. Now here's what I mean by that apparently strange statement. Mathematics is the great equalizer. There's only one answer to a problem, and it doesn't matter whether you are a man or a woman or young or old or from Greece or from Persia, from Athens, from Sparta. The answer is the same. I think this gives for Plato a kind of inspiration about learning in general. He can imagine a common group of students who are working together towards the attainment of mathematical truth. They're, they're bonded precisely by the common objective that they have, and because the objective is mathematical, it's there to be had by all. It might be useful to reflect on this conception of education by contrasting it with some contemporary trends in education. There's a great deal of emphasis played in universities and high schools around the country on the notion of being inclusive. American educators are very concerned that certain ethnic groups might not feel included in, for example, higher education. There was a concern that women would feel excluded by certain forms of education. And what has been, by and large, the typical American response to this need for inclusion? The answer has been, let's make sure that each of these individual groups gets their own little department in the university. So when it comes to women, we'll have women's studies. And when it comes to African Americans, we'll have African American studies. 
And if there are gay and lesbian people who want to be represented in the university, why not have a department of gay and lesbian studies? These are very common uh, projects in American education. I think Plato would find this backwards. Whether he's right or not is another question, and you certainly should think about that on your own. I think Plato would say, if you want to include African Americans and women and gays and lesbians, if you want to include everybody, let's have a common subject to aspire to. Let's have a universal truth towards which we aim that can embrace us all. Doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman. When you're solving a mathematical equation, you're on a level playing field, and the answer will not be in the slightest bit prejudiced. Again, I'm offering these reflections to give you a general sense about Book 7. The details are very hard to follow concerning ancient mathematics, but the overall thrust of the chapter should now be making some sense, especially when you remember our discussion of the divided line. Mathematics is fundamental in the formation of a philosophical soul, and our guardians must be philosophers so they can bring enlightenment into the city. A last way to put up this point and to make a suggestion. If you've ever known a mathematician, it's likely this person will have told you that mathematics is beautiful. The greatest mathematicians have long felt this. They study mathematics not because it's practical, although it is, not because it's useful, but because the sheer beauty of formal structure, the sheer beauty of literally perfection, shines through in mathematical truth. To take a ridiculously simple example, the one I've cited, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a perfectly true sentence. And that has, as trivial as it is, a beauty to it. And I think this notion of beauty has long inspired mathematically minded thinkers. I think it inspired Plato. And as a result, in Plato's academy, and you recall that was the school that he founded, mathematics seems to have been a prerequisite. One had to study geometry in order to enter Plato's academy. Let's turn to the culmination of the education of the guardians. And just as we learned in our study of the divided line, that is called dialectic. Socrates discusses this from 537b to 541b. Dialectic is the study of forms. Dialectic is inspired by the what is it question that Socrates is famous for asking. The first and perhaps the most interesting point that Socrates makes about dialectic is that it's potentially very dangerous, and it's especially dangerous for young people. As you read through Book 7, you'll see that the curriculum of the Guardians is very rigidly regimented. Guardians, until they're about 20 years old, do very little else but engage in physical exercise and training. You recall that's called gymnastic. Between 20 and 30, these future rulers only study mathematics. But when they're 30 and then up to the age of about 35, they start to get their first introduction to dialectic. To complete the sequence, between the ages of 35 and 50, the guardians will be required to go down into the cave where they will rule the city. Then at the age of 50, they return to the study of dialectic, and only at that very late stage of their education will they finally get a peek at the idea of the good, the pinnacle of their study. Now, I mentioned this point in conjunction with my earlier point that dialectic is potentially quite dangerous for young people. 
And I want to elaborate a little bit on that. I told you a story several lectures ago, which I'll repeat. Imagine that there is a young Athenian soldier, and his leaders tell him that he must go to war. And his leaders try to inspire him by telling him that this will be a just war. Perhaps this was a soldier in the year 431, when the Peloponnesian War broke out. This soldier, in my hypothetical story, is on his way to serve in the army when he bumps into Socrates. And what does Socrates do? He says, where are you going? And the kid says, I'm going to war. Why are you going to war? Because the cause is just, and I'm willing even to lose my life if my city requires me to do so. Socrates would then hit him with his question, what is justice? Well, we have studied the Republic. We know how hard it is to answer this question. It's very difficult to imagine that a 19-year-old boy would be able to make any real progress in answering this question. He certainly wouldn't have an answer ready at hand. And so he leaves the conversation with Socrates puzzled, confused, in a state of wonder, bewilderment. What is justice? I thought I knew. I thought it was what my leaders told me was just. But this man Socrates has disrupted me. This man Socrates has taught me that I do not know what I thought I knew. Well, what might happen? Maybe this boy will become a deserter. Maybe he won't serve in the army. Or maybe even worse. Maybe this boy will say, I don't know what justice is. Maybe I'll go over to the Spartan side. Maybe they're just. Maybe these Athenians who've been ordering me around aren't telling me the truth. Socrates has taught me I don't know what justice is. The door is therefore open to me to do whatever it is I might want to do. Now, I'm telling the story in this way because it corresponds to an actual event with an actual person. His name was Alcibiades, a very famous Athenian. He was famous for two things. He was an associate of Socrates, and he was a traitor to Athens in the Peloponnesian War. He did, in fact, go over to the Spartan side. This, by the way, is no doubt one of the real reasons Socrates was executed in 399. He was thought to be associated with the traitor Alcibiades. The point I'm trying to make is that dialectical inquiry, the inquiry that begins with the question, what is it, and leads to an inquiry into the forms, is potentially subversive of the city. This is why in the educational program outlined in Book 7, Socrates does not allow young people to even be exposed to dialectic until they're at least 30 years old. Let me tell another story that highlights this danger again. Plato wrote a dialogue titled The Carmides. In this dialogue, Socrates talks to a very promising, intelligent young man whose name is Carmides. And Socrates asks him, what is moderation? Perhaps you recall that moderation is one of the four great cardinal virtues. This boy is very famous for being moderate. His uncle, whose name is Critias, brags about him and says Carmides is the most moderate, temperate, self-controlled, Boy, I know. You can imagine what Socrates would do. He asks, what is moderation? Well, not surprisingly, Carmides doesn't know the answer to this question, nor does the older man, Critias. And at the end of this particular dialogue, we are left, as we so often are left with Socrates, with big, fat question marks. We don't know what moderation is. In a similar fashion to my own hypothetical story about the young Athenian soldier who does not know what justice is. This dialogue, titled The Carmides, 
is one of Plato's most ingenious dialogues because these two characters who are prominent in the Charmides, Charmides and Critias, later become two of the infamous 30 tyrants who appeared in 404 and whom we've discussed before. I think this is Plato's own way of reminding us of the dangers of dialectic, the dangers of philosophical inquiry. This is why the guardians are restricted to mathematical study for so long. Plato's dialogues, including the Republic, are rather peculiar in this one sense. They are very often a study of failure. The Charmides is a prime example. Socrates fails to educate Charmides or Critias. He fails to turn Charmides around, to use the metaphor developed in the parable of the cave. He fails to turn Critias around. That's one kind of dialogue that we find very often. There's a second kind of dialogue, and the Republic is an example. This is a dialogue where we readers, whether the reader was an Athenian or an American today, we readers, we don't know at the end of the Republic whether Socrates has succeeded with his main character, Glaucon. Has Socrates turned Glaucon to philosophy through his dialectical questioning, or has he perhaps subverted Glaucon, forced him to reconsider the traditional values he's always held, but not given him a real substitute? In short, dialectic is dangerous. Let me close this lecture with a prefigurement of the next theme that we will study. With the education of the guardians completed at the end of book seven, Socrates is now ready to face up to the question, is the just city possible? The construction project has lasted a very long time it started in book two, and it ends at the end of book seven. And Socrates is ambiguous. If you read the lines at 540b, you'll see Socrates saying, well, I'm really not sure whether this just city that I've created in speech is possible or not. In fact, to quote directly from the text, what he says, it's hard, but in a way, possible. That little phrase, in a way, signals the ambiguity. There's one last thing we have to do if we want our city to become possible, says Socrates. And I'm referring now to 541a. This is the final condition of the possibility of the just city. And it's shocking. He says, we must send everybody who is over the age of 10 out of the city. Now, that is shocking because when he says we must send them out of the city and into the country, what he must mean, to be blunt, is kill everybody over the age of 10. And I think this is a fair inference because you can certainly imagine if you were sending parents out of the city and keeping their children, these parents would immediately get together and say, let's go attack and get our children back. So to avoid that obvious eventuality, no doubt Socrates is saying, if we want this city that we have taken such great pains to construct to come into existence, we're going to have to kill everybody over the age of 10. In the next lecture, we're going to discuss this proposal and use it as an occasion to raise a very big question about the Republic as a whole. Does Plato take it seriously? Does he, in fact, think that everything he has discussed 
in the Republic is something like a blueprint for an actually just city. Or perhaps he doesn't take it as seriously as we might think.